I can make my own terms and then make my own album and get it, you know, and get it out there. So why not let's do it? I feel like, you know, a lot of times people get emotional because they expect things. Don't expect nothing. Yeah. So my mom always, you know, kept me motivated. She always, like from day one, just believed in me. And just her belief in me just kept me going for real. I didn't know shit about shit. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I could press on the show. Yeah, you yeah. said yeah. what the fuck you want to say. <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> so what's good? Welcome back to another episode of the Producer Grind Podcast. Ellen Carrington with me. What's good, fam? I'm just repping for Sound Cartel today. Yeah, shout out to our guys. Man. Yeah, man. Well, let's get it cracking, man. We got a dope guest on the show today. This man has worked with Tory Lanes, Trouble, B.O.B., Dizzy Wright, Joyner Lucas, Ritz, Jaron Bitten, Hopson, Futuristic, Wu Tang, Trinidad James, K Camp, and that new rapper Token. Also got a placement on Foxes, so you think you can dance? Please welcome to the show, Kato on the track. Okay. <laughs> What's good with you, fam? What's up, man? How you feeling today, bro? I'm good, man. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, usually we like to start the podcast just giving a little background about yourself. So for anyone that may not know who you are, just give us like a little bit of uh, how you got to where you're at now and then some of the events that led to your success. Okay. Um, I was born and raised in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, spent the first 18 years of my life there. Went on to college for a year in Philly. Um, and that's where I kind of picked up producing and just messing with production and beats. Um, you know, I'd always played instruments in school, like I was a band kid. And so just in college, that kind of translated like the hip hop scene is so live in Philly. So that had a big inf influence on me. So I just got a cracked version of FL <laughs> and just started making beats. And that's kind of where it all started. And then I dropped out of college, relocated to just outside of Atlanta, and then just started getting active like in the Atlanta hip hop scene and just kind of came up from there. What instruments did you play when you were in band? Uh, drums, percussion. Yeah. Hey. yeah. Hey. That's where I get my rhythm from. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be like... I don't know what I'd be doing. <laughs> Probably not music though. Now, were you were you exposed to hip hop before you went to college, or were like you into hip hop before you got into college? Yeah, I was a fan of all types of music. Mm -hmm. Like in high school, um, you know, I was a big fan of like everything from Incubus to like you know that that era was kind of like the punk rock era. So I was like into that type of music. Like what um, what what year was this? Man. Put me on blast. <laughs> I, I, I kind of want to have my guy did. I just want just for reference. Yeah. I'm 31, so that would have been. Man, can anyone do the math? <laughs> what 97? Like maybe 18. I'm gonna be honest with you. My my entire like school years were just a blur because <laughs> I was so not into school. Like every day to me was just not fun. You know, so. Yeah. Like, did, you, did your like parents make you go to college? Did you want to go? That was a big part of it. Like the pressure of um, my parents wanting me to get a degree, <clears throat> um, you know, so that definitely influenced. But then I just realized later on that, you know, I loved music and I just wanted to do that, you know? Yeah. So <clears throat> do you think that in this day and age, um, dropping out of college and then pursuing your dream is... Uh, like a wise decision, or do you think it's good to go ahead and get that degree just to have it as a backup? I would never tell anyone that school is a bad idea because mm -hmm. I think the the biggest factor in me being able to make music full time was just my knowledge and experience, mm -hmm. you know, and school definitely gives you that or at least gives you part of that. So I would never never tell someone like, don't go to school, drop out if you want to do music mm -hmm. and the experience. I think you can do both. You can go to school you know, get your degree. You can even go to school for music. You know, there's a lot of good networking that comes from that and get your degree, learn shit and do music on the side as much as possible. Do you think it was more of the atmosphere of being in college that is where you got your experience from? Cause I know, cause right now I'm, I go to Georgia state. So yeah, I know that I really, Georgia state. Yeah. I went there for, yeah, a, for a year. year and a half. <laughs> yeah, so like I know that going to Georgia State is cool and all. I mean, I really I learned a lot, but the main thing I learned from is like being around the people. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so that's where the experience comes from. So do you think that going to college is that's where the benefit really lies? Yeah, for sure. I mean, <clears throat> I think networking again is is a huge part of 
the the music game just period Bad. you know you never know i've heard so many times where you'll meet someone in college that later goes on to do great things inside and outside of the music industry and those are good people to know throughout your career throughout your life you know True. so for sure yeah so you got all these dope placements and you're telling us you got that crack version of fl talk to us <laughs> about what it looked like between that FL, you bought one at some point, man. Well, and then I had switched to Reason. Okay, yeah, so yeah. you switched to Reason. So, yeah, so talk about this, even the switch from FL to Reason. Yeah. I, so I stuck with FL for a good couple years. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got my hands on a crack version of Reason. So I had to try that, too. I was like, fuck it, why not? You but know? what made you curious about Reason and not like a machine or an NPC? I think... Um, I don't exactly remember. I was just like, you know, I might as well try it, mm -hmm. you know, um, just try something new. I think it was just trying something new. And then I just really uh, took to the whole like workflow and interface is a lot different, um, but it just clicked with me and I just stuck with that. And which version of Reason? So I started on five. Okay. I'm on 10 now. That's what it is. Yeah. True reason, gang. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we see you got a real good social media following. You know, you got a lot of, um, you know, uh, YouTube subscribers and Instagram subscribers. What are some, what are some, uh, been some of the key steps and talk about that process and, you know, how long it took to get where you are. Yeah, it took a long time. Um, I think really being on funk volume, which, you know, we'll get into later, I'm sure, but being signed to Funk Volume where there was such a huge audience and a huge platform for me to be in front of and put music out in front of, I think that kind of gave me a jump start mm. um, as far as social media. And I just stayed active with it. You know, I, I realized after that experience, I recognized the importance of just staying super active on social media if you want to build an audience and um, which leads to other opportunities, obviously. So... Yeah, that was probably the biggest lesson that I learned coming off of Funk Volume, and then I just kept doing that for years and years and years. You know, do you do you uh, you know put mar uh, marketing dollars behind things on like YouTube or Instagram? For sure, yeah. I spend probably a thousand dollars a month on Facebook ads. Hmm. Um, you know, I also invest in like automation tools that kind of helps me whether I'm scheduling you know, content in advance or targeting specific hashtags on, I could go on for hours about this kind of stuff, but there are lots of tools out there now to, to help you kind of automate your social media and build your following, you know? So you came into the game this way. What way? Well, I mean, I guess, I guess it is to say we, we tend to interview two types of producers, right? The mm -hmm. guy that kind of went the traditional route and yeah. then, you know, the newer guys who, you know, at least have some foothold in online. So mm -hmm. like, this is kind of your bread and butter a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I think earlier in my career, I tried to go for the other kind of, kind of side of producing, just locking myself in the studio with different artists. Uh, but it got to a point where I wasn't really seeing enough back from that. I wasn't seeing enough return from that, mm -hmm. you know? So then I just decided to kind of shift my focus to the internet mm -hmm. and that changed everything for and me. By, by switch your focus to the internet, you mean selling beats online or just networking Selling beats online? online. I mean, I have an online mentorship program called Music Entrepreneur <sighs> Club. Just really, really um, taking advantage of the opportunities that are online, you know, um, because I went the other route and it just, you know, didn't really see enough from that. Um, I was going to say... Do you have a relationship with DJ Payne? Yeah, I do. He's my business partner, actually. Okay, now that I didn't know. Payne I, one, because he'll correct you. He'll excuse correct me, you. DJ Payne, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Payne one. DJ Payne one, I'm sorry. But one thing that changed for me was a big piece of advice I got from him at A3C back in the fall, which was, he goes, listen, man, if you can build your brand, you can sell whatever you want to. 100%. And I literally just took four months off, five months off where I really am not selling beats now. I'm really building my brand still. Yeah. And when you talk about those internet tools, like I found myself looking at some of that stuff this week and I start to realize, oh shit, I'm an internet guy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know when it happened. So that's what sparks me 
It's kind of ask you that question if that yeah. makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't think it kind of happens that suddenly, you know, for me, it was just kind of one thing at a time. Yeah. Just um, learning new things every day and being introduced to different ways of different opportunities. And a lot of it just happened to be online because that's where the people are. You know, that's where my audience is. So why not? So you, you said you said you spent a, you, you spent about a thousand dollars a month on Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. Is that the only ad platform you use? And what 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 would what would be your top three tips that you would give a starting producer that's got a little bit of budget that wants to try to make you know the most out of it? Um. See, I wouldn't recommend just jumping into spending money on ads unless you're at a certain point in your career, unless you already have like uh, somewhat of an audience online. Um, if you have the extra money, man, I, especially if you're, in your, if you're in a city like Atlanta, you know, I would recommend maybe spending that money on some studio time where there's a lot of artists just <clears throat> coming in and out and a lot of placements happen that way. You know, just being in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, I wouldn't even say like paying for collabs is a bad thing necessarily. Just know who you're paying and know who they are and what they can do for you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you can get placements that way and get your beats out or your production out. So it just kind of depends on where you are in your career and what you want to accomplish. You so you're saying I mean? you kind of need to be established before you should try to start selling beats? You should have something going for you? like As far as selling beats online? Yeah. Um, not necessarily. I think if you're if you don't have an audience online, then you have to have really really fucking amazing music, you know, cuz that's that's going to be your biggest selling point is the the beats, the music. So is that even enough like for real for real? No, it's not. You know, if you're selling beats online, you have to definitely understand how to market too and how yeah. to build your brand. Because that's, I guess, what I'm trying to get to. Because I know there's a lot of guys that are, they, they are dope at making beats. Um, you know, they're consistent with, you know, uploading to YouTube, but they're like, you know, we constantly get DMs like, yo, how come I'm not selling any beats? Like, what, what are your guys' advice? You know, I, I, I'm doing everything right, but I'm not, you yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, the whole selling beats online thing is a huge, huge part of, uh, it's like, it's marketing, it's branding, you know? <clears throat> so those guys that understand how to collect emails or incentivize people like customers to how to build an email list, you know, how to communicate with their customers, how to brand themselves on social media. Cause you go to so many of these internet producers, like Instagram pages, right? And it's just like beat video, beat video, beat video, Non-stop, beat video, just beat FL video, studio. Yeah. Laptop. It's, it's like, it's so just saturated. So number one, you always have to have a really good product and that's your music, your beats. It has to be, I want to say it has to be unique in some way. If you're entering that online beat selling marketplace, you have to be able to carve out a lane that's not already there and not being dominated by Cash Money AP or one of the other right, right. hot online producers, you know? have to have your own distinct kind of sound, your own brand. And then you have to get it out there. You have to know how to market it. You have to know how to, again, collect emails. And, um, you know, if you can understand all that, then you might be successful. You give some stuff away for free at times ever? Sure. And why do you t talk about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, look at the game we're in. Like there's a million other producers trying to do the same thing. So it's almost like when you go to the mall food court, right? And there's, you go to the food court, there's all those people standing outside of their restaurants giving you free samples, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of what it's like. Like you have to give people a little bit, a mm -hmm. little taste to give them some value, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and from there, it's their decision whether they want to buy beats from you or go somewhere else. So what, what, are, what have been some key, you know, things that helped you develop your marketing, you know, side? Because people ask me a lot and I tell them there's a lot I went into. I read, you know, a lot of different marketing books, watched a lot of, you know, YouTube videos, Gary Vee especially. Mm -hmm. What are, you know, some of the things that have helped you develop that marketer mindset? Uh, I think the key with building an audience online is engagement, you know, figuring out different ways to engage with your audience. Because now it's like 
you know, uh, now the commodity is people's attention, Mm -hmm. you know, trying to get people's attention is Mm -hmm. the hardest thing to do online. So, um, that's why we see a lot of clout chasing and, and I'm not, you know, that's not my thing. Um, I don't knock anyone that does it, but I find other creative ways to just engage with people that follow me on social media and tag their friends. And you're very authentic with it too. Like it's very you. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing I learned from being on Funk Volume is that um, people see through non-authenticity, you know? So I don't want that to be me. And I just, over the years, I'm comfortable with who I am and um, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to just let people know on social media, you know? Now you say like you have to have something that makes you different from everybody else, especially being a producer. It's super saturated. So how have you done that yourself? Like what makes you stand out from the other producers? I think a lot of it has to do with the artists that I've produced for. I tend Mm. to produce for artists who have like very kind of cult followings Mm. for whatever reason. I don't know what it is. Maybe I should become a cult leader. (laughs) It's, uh, it's weird. They're dope artists though. They're dope. Yeah. And you know, again, one of the key experiences that I took from being on funk volume is that this world that we live in is so huge And there's such a need for music in every industry. So why is everyone focused on trying to get placements with the same 10 artists? Makes sense. You know, like there are so many other artists in the world, especially now in 2018, there are tons of millionaire independent artists that are not signed that love and appreciate good production just as much as the top 10 guys on billboard. Now, how do you go and find those? Because a lot of producers say, yeah, we want to go after those artists, but they don't know where to look. It's so they the just same, default and go it, to the It's top the 10. same way that you would build a relationship with anyone. It's just relationship building. Mm-hmm. Any of the people that I've produced for, I have them in my phone and I can call them, you know, like these are not people that I just randomly DM'd and got lucky. Yeah. Yeah, Just got lucky with a placement. Like these are people that I know and have at least somewhat of a relationship with have been in the studio or hung out with them, you know, like that kind of goes back to how important marketing or networking is in this music industry. And so that also makes me think like when you said to um, invest your money and spending it in studio time, part of that investment is so that you can get, uh, build these relationships. 100%. That's the only reason, you know, it's not, it's not really for (laughs) anything else just to be in the right place at the right time. Sometimes you got to spend that money to, to make that money back, you know? Exactly. So it's, it's more of a long-term investment with a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. You did nobody else by futuristic. Is that you? Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to tell you, I listened to that because you marketed it to me. Word. I heard a clip of it. (laughs) And I threw it in my playlist yep. and, I, and I run that. Right. And it's like, and, and I, I remember I was following before we kind of connect and we're talking online, but I, me, I remember thinking like, man, it's got, that's what you do. This is how you do it. Right. Yeah. And how many times did you sell that to somebody? And now they're listening to it and I'm giving you streams on nobody else because one futuristic is dope. And I know that he has this like niche following. Right. Mm-hmm. And then the beat is unbelievable. And it's yeah, not like anything I'm, I'm hearing. Right. how do you link with futuristic? Um, funk volume days. Yeah. Funk volume days. So he was signed? I thought he was independent. He was independent and he still is independent. Um, and he's low key killing it. You know, he's probably got more money and assets than a lot of these major artists, but you don't know that. Yeah. Have you you seen, y'all seen a clip from futuristic shows? Mm -mm. It it looked like arenas, bro. Yeah. He can, he can sell out his own headlining tour. So do you remember a couple of years ago, there was this dude, he was saying he was a rapping nerd. That's what I was thinking it was, but I know exactly who you're talking about. Oh, so now, yeah, yeah, the freestyle yeah, video. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. And that's how he kind of popped. Right? Oh, he was on World Star, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah he was all yeah. over World Star. A lot of his, um, a lot of his like viral videos yeah. contributed to his come up. And he's a smart dude. Like he's a smart kid. <clears throat> he's not even 30 yet. You know, he's younger than me, but he's got way more money than me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like. Um, but yeah, I met him just, we've, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, just him being an independent artist coming up and funk volume being one of the top independent labels in the U S at one time. Um, you know, we just, we all work together. I'm curious to hear, talk to me a little bit about the culture of funk volume. Cause you uh, credit, you credit a lot of the success that you've had to funk volume. So what's that culture like there? Yeah, it was, was crazy, it like? man. Cause you know, 
I don't know how much people remember about this. I don't know how much your audience, <laughs> you know, knows about Funk Volume, but um, so Funk Volume was Hobson, Dizzy Wright, Jaron Benton, Swizz, DJ Hoppa, me, and uh, they had a couple other producers signed to the label. So, um, you know, Jaron and I were the last people to get signed to Funk Volume, and. Uh, I just remember, bro, like that first night that we announced his signing, Dame, who was the CEO of Funk Volume, he asked us to do a live stream with the fans, you know, just to chop it up with them, answer questions, you know, engage with the fans. And so we tune in and we jump in the, the live stream. And I just remember like the questions were scrolling so fast, you couldn't even read them. So we were just you know, we were just kind of bullshitting for like 30 minutes because we didn't know how to answer the questions. Mm. Um, and that's when I knew shit was real. Yeah. And I didn't even know, I'm gonna be honest, like I didn't even listen to Hobson. Yeah. I didn't I didn't really know who that was. Um, but it just shows you like there's a whole other world of fans of like <laughs> hip hop and music. Yeah. And me getting exposure to that was just opening my eyes to, you know, the possibilities and the opportunities that were out there. So they were almost like when I mentioned cult following earlier, mm -hmm. like we had a cult following. And so it was huge. Like a lot of those artists are like artists like uh, Puya, like the Suicide Boys. They all have that yeah. kind of cult, cult following. That subculture of like yeah. hip hop, you know. It's like that rolling loud crowd. Yeah. Much. Well, it reminds me of that piece on Vice about Brent Fayez, right? I and they, that. And they were talking about how his mm -hmm. manager, he's making like 30000 a month mm -hmm. off really? touring. But what they do is they use Spotify to plan the tours. Mm -hmm. Because you can see where the, the streaming data is coming from mm -hmm. geographically. Oh, yeah, I can right? see that. A lot yeah. of those guys yeah. from SoundCloud did the same and, thing. And what you realize is, oh, snap, this is how you can be the independent artist. You just yeah. have to get your team right yeah. yeah which is something else i wanted to ask you about because oh, you, yeah. you had tweeted yesterday yeah about having a team not having a team can mm -hmm. you talk about that a little bit yeah so i meet you know through my music entrepreneur club my my mentorship program i meet a lot of upcoming artists and producers and one thing that i hear a lot is like i feel like i need a team you know i feel like i need people to help me and most of the time they don't have enough going on for themselves where people can jump in and help them with anything. So it's like, what do you need a team for? You just need to put in the work, mm. you know, you just need to put in more work so that people approach you to be a part of your shit, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people don't realize. And that's what I try to preach is like, you need to do, you need to get to a certain level and pr put in a certain amount of work before anything happens, let alone the money. Yeah. The money comes last, you know? But there are so many things leading up to that point that you have to do on your own to get to that point, you know, and then you'll eventually find success. But I find that just the, the overall mentality and the mindset of a lot of upcoming artists and producers is I need someone in my corner to help me with this or I need people to manage this or, you know, and it's just like, no, you just have to do more work. That's it. That's facts. Hell yeah, I definitely agree with that. And what does that work look like as far besides producing and working on your craft? Like what are, like, like again, just a couple tips that you would give to a young producer that's trying to build his name. I think learning the business is huge. It was huge for me. It changed everything for me. Once I kind of shifted my mentality of like, I'm just a producer to I'm an entrepreneur that just so happens to produce music. And that's what your club really focuses 100%. on. 100%. So that's what my club focuses on. It focuses on like teaching producers about the business, publishing, all the opportunities, because I can't be that person to sit there and tell an upcoming producer, this is exactly what you need to do. Cause everyone has a different path. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to figure out where they fit in. But so my job is just to kind of expand their, their line of sight, their vision of like what's out there, all the opportunities that are out there. Some producers may end up like producing for major artists. Others may go kind of my route and produce for more like um, more independent, like successful independent artists. Or some guys might end up switching to engineering. Some guys might end up, you know, going the sync licensing route. Yeah. It's just there's so much opportunity and 
So that's what we preach in, in Music Entrepreneur Club. And how long did it take you kind of to find your own lane to figure out that this is the route I needed that I take from the time you started producing to about now? Like how long did that take? Um, I think it took a good, man, probably took a good um, six, seven years yeah, for me to right. really lay a foundation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not even till the point that I got paid. Yeah. You know, I didn't get paid till a couple of years after that. Yeah. And then that's when I could live, you know, uh, uh, off of my, my music income. You yeah, know? Cause I saw in one of your videos, you said you had tried to do the music thing two times and failed both times. Yeah, and then facts. the third time was the time you got successful. So 100%. did that success come from selling beats online? Cause I also saw a video where you said you made about 10,000 in a month. So yeah. we talk about the income and how that came about. So the income part, you know, really just came about by me educating myself on all the different revenue streams in the music industry. You know, being a producer, not just a producer, but an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you know, like online beat store, um, my music entrepreneur club, selling merch, like publishing money because I produce for a lot of artists, um, collecting just like one off exclusive licenses wherever I can. Like there's just so many ways of making money. I think it's just so many producers are focused on, okay, I want to produce Drake's next record mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's yeah. it. Yeah. You know, like your, your chances of that happening is literally like one in 10 million, maybe. Especially if you don't have their relationship. Especially. Uh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it was just me putting in a good couple of years to educate myself on the business side mm -hmm. of things. And, you know, once you do that, then you find the opportunities. What about for um, producers who may not necessarily be an entrepreneur at heart? How, what route would you suggest for them to take? Maybe they just love making music. Well, that's how I started. Yeah. I started making, I started out of just loving music. I didn't know shit about business. Mm -hmm. I didn't finish college. Like I don't have a degree. Um, I learned through the past eight years of doing this that, you know, you have to learn that part. That's essential. If you want to create a sustainable career, mm -hmm. not just get one or two hit records, but if you want a career in the longevity, music, the longevity, yeah. then you have to understand the business that you're in, you know, otherwise people aren't going to take you seriously and opportunities aren't going to come like that, you know? So you're either going to have to like sell beats online for the rest of your life or, learn the game. I, I think that's the key word there is career. And a lot of guys don't approach it as such. Yeah. yeah. I've had a lot of people hit me up recently. Oh man, you still doing that producer thing? Yeah. Like, nah, bro, <laughs> this is my, this is what I do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's just, it tripped me out because they make beats too. Yeah. Or they used to, I guess. Hey, you know, I don't know. So I think, I think having that bigger picture approach where like I'm making my full life commitment right. to this is really what divides. Because if you don't, quit you won't fail yeah, yeah. it's like Full separating time. a career and a hobby most yeah. people just take it as a hobby rather than setting it up for a career and that's one thing that i've i've realized is that you know these guys who are asking these questions a lot of times are just putting in part-time work mm -hmm. so of course you're going to want to know how to be full-time if you're just part-time if you're putting in full-time work then you have a better idea of the route that you need to take you have a better idea of what you need to do to become successful and you're just going to be putting in the work, mm -hmm. you know, you won't be online, like trying to figure out like how to do this and how to do that. Of course, you're going to do that along the way anyway, but you know, it's once you start putting in full-time work, you get full-time results. Yeah. Mm. Good Can point. you talk about the partnership with DJ Payne one? Yeah. So music entrepreneur club, uh, it started with just beat club, which I started. Okay. So beat club was just me in the beginning. And it was my online mentorship program. It's a monthly subscription. And I do live streams every single week, you know, whether they're live production tutorials or, um, you know, topic discussions on the business and entrepreneurial side. Uh, and then eventually um, I partnered with Dame, who was the CEO of Funk Volume, because he had started his own club okay. called the Music Entrepreneur Club. Okay. And his was targeted towards artists music managers. So it just clicked in my mind, like, why don't we merge our two clubs? Yeah. So once we did that, 
um, shortly after I had developed a relationship with DJ Payne one through mm -hmm. beat stars and through all the stuff that we've done. And I was like, yo, Payne, why don't you come on board and help me run this? Yeah. You know, so it's the three of us, <clears throat> me, Dame and DJ Payne one run music entrepreneur club now. Mm. That's dope, man. That's dope. Um, so I know another question uh, we want to talk to you about um, your ethnic influence seems evident in some of your branding and marketing. Right. And so I just wanted to ask you about your background, specifically um, being Asian. Mm -hmm. How does that um, shape your approach to your uh, as far as the hip hop culture and your approach to music? Yeah. Um, you know, I think early on, I was a lot more self-conscious of it, you know, coming up in Atlanta. Uh, any like showcase or beat battle or open mic that I would go to, it was either all black or black and white, but I was almost always the only Asian there, you know? Um, and so I was kind of self-conscious of that and I was scared. Like I didn't know what people would think about my beats and, you know, whether they would think I was whack. Uh, but I think in those situations, you have to let your music talk. Mm -hmm. for you so you just have to be really good at what you do and then people just respect you automatically um and so i kind of became comfortable with that and now i see it as an advantage because mm -hmm. just looking at me i'm all automatically different from everyone it else makes you stand and, out yeah and you know once they hear the music hopefully then they have a certain level of respect just because of if it's dope you know um so yeah i mean i, I don't really uh I don't really think about it too much anymore, but I think I use it more to my advantage now. Yeah. Now, what about what type of music you used to listen to? Did you listen to different types of music and use that to influence the production that you do now? Uh, yeah. Well, I think also being Korean, Asian um, opened up different doors for me automatically, just like in the Korean hip hop world mm -hmm. and the K-pop world. Which is booming. Which yeah. if you know anything about K-pop, it's like- BTS it's is huge. going crazy. You know, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, want, I was, I was wanting to hear more. I was telling character, I thought that's like a document, documentary on Netflix. And that's, we we very much measure like why we ask stuff, right? Yeah. And the CEO brought up, he said, you know, there's Asian producers out there. They're sitting in their bedroom saying, I might be identified with this guy, right? Yeah. And so I, that's really what I was kind of just, I wanted to get from you, right? And so can you talk more about the, like the K-pop and the... Yeah, so... You know, just me being Korean and knowing a lot of other Koreans, uh, it, kind of, it kind of opened the doors to just me having more opportunities automatically. And so, you know, I've produced for some pretty big Korean hip hop artists mm -hmm. um, and got placements just through knowing the right people. Um, and hopefully I can go on to do more with that, you know, but it's a it's a huge opportunity, huge advantage. Just and I didn't even have to do anything. <laughs> did you get that work done from the states, or did you have to travel over from the states? Oh hell yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, but I do. I would love to go to Korea, to Asia, and you know, tour, meet more people, and work with more artists. Uh, that's definitely on my to do list. That's what's up. That's what's up. Well, now it's time for overrated, underrated on the Producer Grind podcast with Kato on the track. <laughs> Kato, we present you with five topics. We ask you if those topics are overrated, underrated. You simply respond with one of those. And if we feel it merits further discussion, we'll ask. So are you ready, Kato? Let's do it. Overrated, underrated on the Producer Grind podcast. Overrated, underrated email blasts. Email blasts? Yeah. Overrated. Really? And why is that? I think uh, it depends on the context that you kind of talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of people are doing it wrong. Spammy, right? Most people resort to like spammy. Exactly. Tactics. So when they say email blast, it's like, well, are you really like engaging with your email audience or are you just blasting out emails and spamming people, mm -hmm. you know. Can you give us a quick two sentence strategy on email blasts to do them the right way? Just, just talk to people like we'd be talking now, you know, like I think people always try to sell something mm -hmm. and instead of selling something, why don't you give something like give some value, like give people a reason to open that email instead of just trying to sell stuff all the time. You mm -hmm. know, I think if people provided more value, then they wouldn't have a problem with 
open rates. <laughs> One thing I'll say about this, I heard you say you spent a couple of years engaging in the Atlanta hip hop community. Yeah. Right. I really think being on the ground and having something to do on a weekly or bi-weekly basis gives you something to talk to your audience about, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and outside of that, just, you know, to build a brand, you kind of have to let people into your life a little bit. You know, you have to, you can't just be that guy like in the studio all the time and that's all you show them. Like, obviously you, you do other stuff, you know, you have a real life, hopefully. <laughs> and so I don't know, some producers out there might not have a life and they just meet, might be in the studio all the time. Straight locked in. But then, yeah. yeah. But then if that's the case, like, you know, get to know your audience, like mm-hmm. talk to them. Don't just, uh, show them who you are, but you have to understand who your audience is at the same time. That's just as important, you know? So engage with them, figure out who they are. My man, Gary V said yesterday in the video, remember that your content doesn't always have to be you. Mm. The other day when we had a piece, I had the homie, one of the guys been helping us out. I just filmed him for like two minutes because he's just going off on some dope shit. And I'm like, yeah, yo, just film your homie talking sometimes. You know what I'm saying? You never know, man. Yeah. Overrated, underrated on the Producer Grind podcast with Cato. Overrated, underrated, LeBron to the Lakers. Overrated. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and give them something to talk about in the comments real quick. I mean, I, I don't even watch sports like that. That's why I think it's overrated. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, I mean, I think, didn't people know this was going to happen eventually? Or was, I don't <laughs> I know, you guys been, let me know. I have no idea. I don't watch basketball. I'm just going to keep it funky. Like once... I started picking up this producer shit. Like I really stopped watching. Yeah, <laughs> and right. next you know, like, oh, it's a big deal. LeBron move. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's how I felt. So over fucking rated. <laughs> <laughs> Overrated, underrated. Having a team. Hmm. Overrated. Okay. You already explained that. Overrated, underrated on the producer grind co- podcast with Kato. Overrated, underrated, tight beats as a marketing tool. Oh man, y'all got the good, uh, the good thought provokers. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, you know what, until someone figures out something better, I'm going to say underrated. Okay. Mm. I think we're going to ask you about that in a minute. We're going to come back to that. Cool. And lastly, on overrated, underrated on the producer, excuse me, overrated, underrated on the producer grind podcast with Cato, um, starting beat stores in 2018, like starting brand new, starting a beat store today. Overrated. I do want to hear more about that. Is that because you don't, you have to have that following first and then open up the beat store? No, I think it's just because everyone's trying to do it. You know, why are you trying to do something that? millions of other people are already, you know, killing, dominating. True. Do you think beats online are fading out? Is that like, uh, or, t- you know, YouTube, all that? I don't think it's fading out. I think, um, I think it definitely is heading in the direction of, you know, more beats are getting consumed online. You know, you can purchase a license online. Um, I don't know if that's going to change. I just think, producers need to expose themselves to other opportunities too, mm. you know, like I think Warren Buffett, right. The, the richest man in the world said um, that he prefers investing in businesses where there's no competition. Mm. Mm. And that's like the opposite of the, the music industry. Yeah, right. <laughs> like once something becomes popular in the music industry, everyone wants to do it. And the barrier of entry to selling beats online is so low that literally anyone can do it. Yeah. It's just, are you going to be successful at it? Mm-hmm. You know? And so how much, this is kind of a side question. So if, if you were to, you know, start selling beats, how many hours a week are you going to have to dedicate to, to, to actually see a return in a few months to a year? Um, full time, full 40 time, plus. 40 to 80 hours a week. If you're not putting in 40 to 80 hours a week doing what you do, whether that's selling beats online or just, whatever, then 
it's going to take you that much longer or you're not going to be successful mm. period my question was gonna be how much money mm. if because mm. i'm gonna be honest one reason i got off selling beats online because i could i could project like in six months like i'm going to need to spend this much money to get to this point mm. right can you talk about that part yeah i mean i think just the the t- the sweat equity you know is also going to be a huge huge investment if you want to be successful at all in the music industry and that's going to take a lot of time energy money um everything and that's kind of part of the reason why i started music entrepreneur club b club is because i saw that lack of education in our in our field mm. you know and so I felt like it was something that I could help other producers with. Um, and for $25 a month, I mean, shit, like what's there to think about, yeah. you know? Do you ever have to um, redirect some of the people that sign up for the entrepreneur club? So maybe they their dream is to be a producer, but mm-hmm. maybe you see that their talents are maybe in photography or something still in the music industry but not necessarily making beats. Do you ever have to redirect them or just give them guidance on that? I give them guidance. You know, I let them know like there are other opportunities, especially with engineering. Cause I find a lot of producers have a lot of interest in the technical side of music, mm. you know, and sound design, that type of thing. So, um, you know, I never shit on any, anyone's dreams, but the other huge thing, right? This is a huge thing for me is that, I've met a lot of upcoming artists and producers with this crazy sense of entitlement, like someone owes them something or they feel like people owe it to him or her to listen to their music. And what do you mean by that? Like, um, like they walk in the studio and just like have an aura to them. Okay. Perfect example. Right. I've had a couple members in beat club where we do music critiques every month. We do live beat critiques and I'll give them my honest feedback. Like, you know, I think your beats sound dated. There's no nice way to put that. It's just, I'm saying that in the nicest way possible. Like I think your sound selection could be better. It kind of sounds like a little 2000 ish. Mm -hmm. Um, Try adding some like modern sonics in there right and a lot of producers will like go off on me for that (laughs) just just for giving them my honest opinion and not even like is that like mean like is it fucked up to tell someone like you know your your beats sound dated i I think think it'd be more fucked up to take their money and lie to them yeah exactly that's how i feel like i would be much more fucked up to be lying to you man that shit hard bro yeah like that's i I'm not going to do that, yeah. you know? Did you ever do futureproducers.com back in the day? I probably the did. Fall? Yeah. yeah. I remember futureproducers.com, like, I knew a long time ago people would rip your shit to shreds. Like, that's all they used to do when they was ripping people's <laughs> shit to shreds. So, like, that used to be, my, my driving fear. So, like, if I'm going to play my shit for a fucking Kato on the track, I'm going to be ready for it and be like, yo, and this is what it is. I'm 100%. But you'd be surprised. Like, a lot of these guys, like, they'll get offended because they feel like their music is the shit already. And they don't really need anyone to tell them differently. You then know, why sign up? Yeah. Cause they, exactly. thought he, they thought he was going to be like, Oh, come on, man. I got to write a video for you. Like, yeah. an ego boost, they like an ego boost or something they're it, looking for. It's either that, or they think that I can do something for them hmm. other than just like, guidance yeah you know maybe get them a placement or kind of whatever looking, looking for you to do the work for them looking for me to yeah. do something for them yeah. you know and i'm already doing something for you like <laughs> i'm i'm helping you understand that your beats sound dated you know yeah. like yeah. that's what i'm trying to do and so you know it's crazy how many people i come across on social media like my dms are flooded with people who think i owe them my time mm-hmm. or owe them anything without them having put in the work first, you know? That's That's one thing I can't say about everyone that shows up to our VIP showcases. They're all very, very receptive of the criticisms and the critique. Shout out to all the, everyone that comes out to the producer grind events. Yeah, that's dope. And those are people that um, I will be much more willing to help than someone who has entitlement. Absolutely. Also too, like if I can say this, one, people don't ask anymore. They just demand. Yeah. One, that's one. And two, I was always taught, like, if you ask something for some, 
when I hit you up about doing this interview, I said, hey, man, if you ain't got time, I definitely understand. Yeah. You got to let people off, people off the hook and give them a chance to like just say no and it be OK. Yeah. And a lot of these guys don't do that. No, not at all, <laughs> especially on social media. How do you handle those situations? Do you just do they happen in person? Does it happen in person? Yeah, it does it happen in person. And how do you handle that? <laughs> I think it happens more online. But yeah, yeah. I see it face to face, too, really? you know, when when uh, people aren't as receptive to getting feedback from someone, mm. you know, and it's like, this is the kind of shit that helped me it's grow. cringes. Like when you see it, it just makes you cringe. Yeah. I mean, it just makes you realize like how few people are really fit to become successful in this, you know, mm -hmm. cause it is hard. Hey, this is what I would say to those people. You seen the Kobe meme where it's like, oh, when I hear my old beats and the face I make when I thought I was ready to kill shit with them old beats, and he's kind of <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like, yo, go back and listen to your beat. First of all, if you've been making beats that long, go back and listen to your beats from two years ago. You realize like, oh shit, I wasn't the shit like I thought you I think was. You think he was the shit back in the day, right? <laughs> yeah. You could listen to him be like, what was I thinking? Yeah. And honestly, music is the easiest part of what we do. You know, <laughs> so true. if you That's can't so even true. take some feedback on on that, you're going to have a real hard time getting rejection in so many other different levels. Mm. You know, what are just, some of those like principles that um, that you see in other or like what are some things that you see in another person that, you know, hey, they're going to be they're going to be all right or the success may come. They have a better chance of being successful. Yeah, I, I have noticed that. So thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. But it's like it's always a just the attitude, you know, just an overall attitude towards and perspective towards how you see life, you know, mm -hmm. not just the music industry, but they're always positive. They always are optimistic about situations. Even when shit is going bad, like they always think about the positives, right? Um, I think it's a willingness to learn and to listen to other people. And even if you don't agree, just being willing to listen to what they have to say. Um, I think those three things are like the key uh, characteristics of any successful person that I've ever met. And that sounds like the same thing you go and you watch videos on Mark Cuban or any successful entrepreneur, just person in general, they'll always say those same th three things. Yeah, it's true. It's very true. So let's, let's go back to talking about your YouTube a little. Um, you know, you were you were pretty consistent with the vlogs, mm -hmm. but we, we were looking, we haven't seen one in like the past few months. Is it just because you got so much other stuff you do and you do it all yourself or is you maybe don't see as much of a re return on the vlogs as you would like? Or I think I became more of a fan of the short form of like giving people my life, you know, so giving them the quick 10 second Instagram story mm -hmm. or giving them uh, a little tweet about what's going on in my head or, you know, just those shorter forms of social media um, because anyone that does their own video, video editing knows that it's a lot of fucking work. It takes a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I edited out like out a yeah, five minute KO. vlog, right? Shout out to my man here. <laughs> I edited like a five minute vlog and it took me like goddamn almost a day yeah, to edit that shit, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. I think with the long form, especially like, well, I was going to ask you, so have you been using IGTV? Yeah. I wanted to ask about that too. I haven't jumped into it yet, but I definitely want to. What are your thoughts about it? Do you think it's, it's going to be short-lived? you think it's something like, oh, shoot, this is something we really should invest in? I think I want to say it'll work, you know, because I think IG, Instagram, they haven't missed yet with any of their mm. stuff. You know, when they launched IG Stories, Facts. people were like, oh, but it's not as good as Snapchat is like they're copying Snapchat. Now Snapchat's dead and IG stories right. is like. You, you, had ask today. <laughs> you know, it's so funny though. Cause I was, I was listening to that Gary Vee podcast earlier today and he said, Snapchat may not necessarily be dead, but it's not at its height. Like he says, it's any moment, it's true. any social media is one feature or one thing away from everyone being like, Oh snap, Snapchat's doing this now. Yeah. So that's why he was talking about don't sleep on Snapchat. Don't sleep on Facebook. Don't sleep on uh, Twitter, but to diversify your social yeah. media. Yeah. If you have an audience on there, definitely don't abandon them. Right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if that's where your audience is, then I would, I would go there. I abandoned them, but anybody who was on there was already on my other stuff, too. <laughs> like, and, that's, and that's the thing. Like, how, just having a strategy. Like, yeah. a lot of times yeah. I find that people that ask some questions, like, have no strategy. Like, if you have a plan, like, I already have a plan. I'm working on IGT. Yeah. I'm going to see how long it's going to work. But I have a plan. Like, have a plan to work. Just something. But don't just be sitting there with your thumb up your ass and going, what do I do? Yeah. <laughs>
yeah. as an Instagram user, have you found yourself like using and watching IGTV just as a regular user? Um, not so much IGTV. Because um, I want to say that too, because it's kind of out of it's out of the way. You know what I mean? You got to yeah. go, and then it, you can't really like find stuff. You got to just keep scrolling through. It's kind of weird. I think they'll improve that with time. Yeah. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. Um, but it's early too. It's super early. Yeah. What yeah. two weeks a week? Well, it's been it's been two weeks, and what I'm finding is like you're you're an influencer. We're influencers, right? We're mad close to this shit. I'm starting mm-hmm. to talk to other people who aren't who don't do what we do. They're like, "What? How do I get to it?" Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm like, "How you don't?" That's all I've been focusing on for the last two weeks. So it's new. Yeah, I mean, Take it's that, new. Like, have you ever seen that chart where it's like um, the rate of people of adopting it, like adopting new technology? It's like the first ten percent are like uh, the people that are always on that cutting edge, and then it yeah. takes like like the, the nurse, last thirty four percent for yeah, everyone. Yeah, 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 we're, we're early adopters. Man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, but it's it's the same platform. So as long as you keep growing your Instagram, I think it'll be it shouldn't be difficult to to translate to um, IGTV. Mm. When you started, really um, takes this off. is a question I wanted to ask. When you started your YouTube, did you start it for um, as a way to promote your beats or promote your selling beats online, or what was your thought process behind creating your YouTube? Uh, so if you go, I think I started my YouTube in two thousand eight. Oh, so okay. if you go all the way back to like my first videos, it was I, like I was still rapping at the time, <laughs> you know, so that's what I wanted it for. Like I just made it like how every other artist uses it, like to just promote my music, put my put my stuff out there. Um, and then over the years, it's like turned into a platform for me to release new beats mm-hmm. um, and just put out other types of visual content, you know. It just, that didn't just change for you. That changed for everybody in a yeah. sense, right? Yeah. 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 As YouTube grew as yeah. a platform. Um, you ever rock with teambackpack.net? Yeah. Which I heard doesn't exist anymore. <gasps> what? Yeah. I heard Team Backpack uh, kind of had a funk volume situation and they dissolved and now it's called World Underground. Okay. Um, but yeah, I have produced several of their top ciphers for yeah. sure. That's dope, man. Like, how'd you get involved with that? Because that was like that was a big thing for a little while. For a little while, yeah, yeah. it was huge. You like saw worldwide, those, right? Yeah, you saw those. What is Team Backpack? What is that? It's like a battle rap or something. Uh, yeah, it's it was a platform for you know upcoming artists to just showcase their their bars. Mm. It was really like bar heavy, you know, people who could really spit. seriously rap, oh, okay. you know, and um, a lot of those videos went viral, but. Um, yeah, I guess they don't exist. RIP. The, and it was funny because I used to follow them and I had this bright idea three years ago. I mean, I can rap. I don't, I don't like rap. Drop some bars, man. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Why not? <laughs> hey, no, no, don't do that. No, please, no, please, I won't. No. But here's the idea I had. I go, well, let me do this team backpack dog net shit. Yeah. Make these motherfuckers think I'm a rapper, yeah. but really I'm a producer trying to slide in on the slot. So I, I remember I did one of the contests one year. I got into like a review round or some shit like right, that. Right. But one of those creative ideas, like, yo, and those are the types of things people got to be doing. Like, yeah. yo, I'm the only producer here around a bunch of rappers. They think I'm competing with them. Really, I'm trying, hey, man, you need beats? Yeah. Hey, man, you need beats? Yeah, that's Let a good idea. On the five fingers of death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, uh... <laughs> that was a high No, no, no. no, no, no. We, we don't have time for that. <laughs> well, shit, we got another segment on uh, the Producer Grind podcast. It's called The Um Factor. Oh, so exactly. what we do is we give you a topic to talk about for 30 seconds without pausing, saying, ah, ooh, or anything. Just talk consistently. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah, so today... We got the topic for today is everything you know about selling beats or marketing online. Mm. Oh, you got the timer ready? I got the timer ready. Let's get to it. A second to think or just go. Five, four. We have Kato on the track on the Um Factor on Producer Grind Podcast. Are you ready? Ready. Set. Go. Selling beats online is a beast. It's heavily, heavily, heavily saturated. It's probably one of the hardest things that I've had to learn in terms of figuring out how to market myself, how to brand yourself. Um, If you're successful. He made it to 10. He made it to 10. Not bad. That's all right. Not bad. But go ahead and finish um, what you were talking about. The last few I was going to say, if you're successful at it, it can be extremely profitable. Like you can make a lot of money. Um, I remember 
I've, I think the most I've made from selling beats online to this day uh, in a single month has been about 30,000. Wow. And that was, that was, (laughs) (laughs) I brought it here today. (laughs) Um, No, but that was a, that was a good month and it's, it's consistently climbed. So my average has, has definitely gone up, but. It took me a good couple of years. Yeah, to, but it didn't, that just didn't happen overnight. That's years and Hell years no. yeah. and years. Years and years of just and fucking up, making mistakes and learning. Would you say that's mostly from YouTube or is that a lot from your Facebook ad deployment? Or I think it's a little bit from everywhere, which is why I've kind of distributed my audience to different platforms. I think it comes from YouTube, comes from Instagram, comes from Facebook. You know, so just getting the word out, really. What's your mindset when you're creating an ad on Facebook? Like, what what are you doing? Get people to pay attention. You know, create something that... Um, create something that has brand recognition to them already so that they're not seeing something brand new. You know, so for me... It's like using Facebook pixels, right? Facebook pixel is like a retargeting tool. So Mm -hmm. anyone that comes to my website, it tracks them. And so anytime I run an ad on Facebook, it's going to retarget those people who have already been to my website. It's Mm -hmm. those kinds of things like brand recognition. Um, That's what any brand or company you see on TV that's running ads all the time, that's what they're doing. They're just constantly you know, getting it into your head that they exist and that you want this. Right. right. And that's kind of the, the perspective that you have to do as a, as a producer too, if you're trying to sell beats online. Sound kind of messed up when you say it like that. Hey, yeah, man, it you does. Want this, man. You want this. <laughs> it does. <laughs> that's what all marketing is. That's though. what marketing is. You know, you have to really understand that, that mentality of, um, persuasion persuasion and building a brand. I know? knew all about the, you did the, the mixtape with, uh, beat stars. At the end of last year. Oh yeah, one week notice. Yeah, one week notice. I you guys did a great job. I Thank found you. out about it. Checked out the yo. This is pretty dope. Appreciate wake that. up and ca- uh, wake up, cake up. Wake up, cake up. Wake up, yeah. cake up. Talk about that. Like you just oh, like yeah. I know all oh, about yeah. that because I'm following Kato and this shit is dope. Like talk <laughs> about that. Wake up, cake up was is a lo-fi instrumental album that I put together, and that just kind of happened because. I was going through a period where I was just kind of tired of working with artists, got kind of stale with me. So I wanted to go back to what I knew best, which was making beats and doing something different, you know? Um, Cause I don't know that a lot of producers in my position who are like releasing instrumental albums, let alone a lo-fi instrumental album. So I kind of did a little bit of research and found that there's this whole world of lo-fi beats. And it's just now starting to kind of creep into the mainstream. Right, it's crazy. And I'm sure you as a student, you know, like a lot of kids when they study now, they just turn on lo-fi beats. So I'm kind of, you know, Chill Hot Radio? You ever heard of that? Yeah, Chill Hot. What is that on uh, Spotify or something? Yeah, it's like the 24 hours. Shouts out to Controller Rise too, they're my guys. Yeah, they're, yeah. Doing, they're doing big with the lo-fi movement. So when you started sure. um, with the lo-fi, like what was your objective to it? Because at first when I heard that you created an instrumental album, I was thinking, oh, maybe he's trying to get placements. But then I heard it's a lo-fi instrumental album. So what's your objective with that? Uh, a couple different things. So we're in the age of streaming. So I recognize the opportunity that I have as a producer to just release instrumental music mm-hmm. for students or for people that are just doing menial, like, like repetitive daily tasks that just like listen to background music, you know? So I saw that as an opportunity. If you jump on Spotify, there are tons of lo-fi playlists with like half a million up to a million followers. If I just get one of my beats on those playlists, then it's gonna, it's gonna populate my Spotify page like crazy. So I think that was one of the goals, Mm -hmm. um, just to get it on Spotify and streaming. And number two, um, I think it's good brand building. You know, it shows that you're just. Um, Who did your art? That was dope. Uh, shout out to Alessandro, who is this Italian graphic designer in Italy. And he actually designed one of my past album covers. So I had him design. Uh, Have you seen this? Mm-hmm. It looked. 
his face looks like a cake and it's oh, like it's a, a slice, slice of cake yeah, coming out this, and I'm like yo every time I see that it's your logo on your Instagram yeah. that's your YouTube logo too yeah, right? yeah, yeah. is yeah. your instrumental album streaming 24-7 on YouTube yeah yeah I've been seeing a lot of um, every time I look up lo-fi I just put it on it's always a lot it's like live now and it's the same channel over and over but it's always been live oh I got you yeah, yeah. I mean I put all my music on all platforms anytime I release, anytime mm-hmm. I drop some. So in a, in a sense, I mean, you know, you're not the first to do an instrumental album, but you're like pioneering this like business model, right? Because here's, as soon as I seen that and mm-hmm. I listened to it, look, okay, I'm doing one. I just, I know I want it to be ducks in a row. Yeah. I know, damn, his art was dope. So my art got to be dope. Yeah. Damn, he had a good ad campaign. It reached me and I'm watching the research. So that, and so, because I'm watching, I'm thinking about people who watch this. They're going to go, oh, I'm going to put together. Yeah. No, he didn't do that. It's yeah. a plan. It's a plan. Like, yeah. it, this shit is dope because he put all those pieces together, man. Yeah. And and the last thing that I forgot to mention is that um, a lot of artists and rappers follow me. So, obviously, if I'm dropping eight brand new free beats, like, they're going to want to rap on it. Yeah. Right? So, I had a lot of that. I put all the beats in my beat store. A lot of people purchased a license just to rap on it and re-release it. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's populating more content from just that one piece of content. And I'm collecting content ID revenue off oh, yeah, of that. I was going to say, right? You know, so anytime they release that music on YouTube, then I'm making money off of that. So it's content creating more content, which ultimately monetizes it for me. And then it's just good music. Like, that's the shit that I love, you know. Do you guys talk about in... in um B club, do you guys talk about like specific strategies, like like talk, like so? Hey man, I got this and that, and I want to learn how to. That's something I can come learn how to do at B club. Yeah, so every usually every week we have a special guest, whether that's a special guest producer, uh, an industry exec, um, you know, you throw an some A&R. examples out there. Yeah, so we've had Crooked Eye. Um, the other week we had the senior vice president of Warner music. Um, I've had a lot of producers from justice league to, uh, God, I've had so many guests over the past two years. Um, who else have we had? We've had a lot of people, man. If you go to music entrepreneur club.com, you can see a lot of like, our special guests that have been mm-hmm. in our sessions before. I know I'm leaving off a lot of people. This always happens when people yeah. ask me like, like my production credits. Yeah. I'm like, uh, Jaren Benton. Um, <laughs> That's about it. Really. <laughs> just blank out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we've had a lot of guests, man. It's, it's definitely well worth it. And we bring on people who specialize in what they do. We don't claim to know everything ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to find and bring people on that know what they're talking about. So we're bringing on people that have been doing what they do, just like we've been doing what we do for a long time to help you guys strategize or learn or whatever it is that you want to do, you know? That's what's up. All right. So one last thing we got for you. So um, in the office, they know I'm a Cardi B fan. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and actually. Here we go. And this song, <laughs> I had to ask. <laughs> it is it is song I'm about to ask about actually became one of my favorite songs on the album, yep. um, which is yep. which is Money Bag. So I think it was the day after the release you put out a video comparing one of your songs with was it with Jaren Benton? Yeah, with Jaren. With Jaren to Money Bag. You said I remember you said you said it, there was no you you didn't claim theft, you claimed similarity. Similarities. There were definitely and I didn't even know until Jaren reached out to me after her album dropped or no, Jaren didn't reach out to me. A fan tweeted me and said, uh, this, this like sounds very similar to Cato and Jaren's money bag. Mm -hmm. And so that's what prompted me to like, look into that and, you know, same title, um, similarities in the hook, but I'm a Cardi B fan too. You know, I didn't, I didn't come after her. Like no, you, Cardi, you, you, you stole didn't. my song. Like, <laughs> fuck you. Yeah. I didn't do any of that. Like I kept it very, uh, very respectful. I co-signed that. He did that. It was, did you get a lot of hits on the video? I think so. It did. All right. It got maybe 60,000 views on Facebook and, you know, a bunch of retweets. Okay. 
you know. But um, so plot twist: we we actually will be re-releasing our version of the song on this upcoming album. Jaren and I have an album dropping on July twenty seventh. It's called Yuck Fu. It'll be dropping on Rock Nation. Dope title. Um, Whoa, he just glad. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what's that? Rock Nation? Yeah, Jay Z just called me one day and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish. Yeah, so we have an album dropping on Rock Nation. Yeah. We're going to re release the song with a special guest feature. And so just stay tuned. Oh, there's a special guest. Okay. okay. All right. All right. So what's next for you in 2018 besides you get, you're dropping the album, yep. you know what I'm saying? Do, or do we see another instrumental album coming before the end of the year? Hopefully. Um, after we drop the album, we're going on tour. So I'll be on the road for a couple of weeks. And then I think we want to do more tours throughout the year. So I think we're going to do Canada, um, might hit Europe. Overseas. Overseas. <laughs> Shout out to Vancouver. <laughs> um, That's stupid. Um, yeah, so, uh, I have an annual rap contest oh. that is going to drop, um, this, this month in August, uh, and I have some really cool partners with that. So that'll be dope too. Are we going to see you at A3C? I'll be there. Yeah. Beat Star Summit. All right. We'll see you there. But um where can we find you on social media and also where can we find make sure we get the beat club social media stuff too uh at kato producer on everything k-a-t-o producer and at music entrepreneur club on instagram and wake up cake up what platforms available everywhere spotify apple music soundcloud youtube Google Play. I don't know if anyone uses Google Play, but it's definitely one <laughs> Amazon of Music. Amazon yeah. Music. Shout yeah. out to Amazon. Cool, man. We definitely appreciate you stopping by, bro. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Definitely. Another dope Thank episode you. in the bags. Peace. Peace. Peace.